is awesome. Thank you for having me. For those of you who aren't familiar with the Bay Citizen, what we are, we're a, uh, an online news organization. And basically our goal, we just started last year, is to produce kick-ass journalism for the Bay Area. You can find, it, you can find us online at uh, baycitizen.org. And uh, Friday and Sunday in the New York Times, we produce the Bay Area edition of the New York Times. Thanks so much for having us here. This is just great. So um, I just today got back from uh, Buffalo, New York, where I attended um, the third annual uh, motorcycle ride in memory of a guy named John Cote, who was uh, a friend of mine who was who was kidnapped and killed in in Iraq. And um, uh, John was a, a paid mercenary in Iraq. Um, but uh, he was a, he was a super nice mercenary, and um, everyone everyone loved him, uh, including me. And um, you know he was just sort of a lost soul who had done tours in Iraq with the army, and then uh, went to the University of Florida to be an accounting major, and which was a really really bad fit. And uh, to find himself, really, he went back to Iraq to, you know, to do a job that, that he had already really done for, for a lot more money. And, um, and I, I hung out with him because uh, he really made me feel safe when, when I was in Iraq. I, I, was, I had gone to, to do a story of, about mercenaries, which um, ultimately became this book. And, um, I didn't know really what I would find, you know, I, I expected, well, you know, mercenaries, you know, they're paid to, to fight the war, so they, you know, they must be, they must be pretty good, but when I, when I actually got there, um, the company that, that he was working for was, you know, incredibly, incredibly fucked up, and, um, you know, it was just, it was just kind of a joke of a company, they had, you know, I, I, the guys who worked there had, had gotten their jobs like, you know, on the internet and through email and, you know, one of their, one of their, the guys who worked for was like a, a, a novelist who had sort of gone there to, to get material for his book and, um, and then there was another guy who was, a, had lost his job as a police officer because he was an alcoholic and, um, and I, and I suddenly found myself in the middle of this, this, crazy situation and uh, and every day these guys were based in Kuwait and they they would drive up to the border and they'd go into Iraq and protect these supply convoys but they were you know it was just a total mess and 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 every time I would go up with these guys I had never been more terrified and um, John made me feel safe you know he, he was the one guy who, who really had his shit together and then uh, my father was was very sick at the time, and I uh, I was hanging out mostly with John, just driving into Iraq and out of Iraq, and um, and then I had to go home very quickly because my my father was dying, and um, I got home, and then my father died, and uh, and as I was cleaning out his apartment, I got a call from my editor telling me that John Cote and all these other guys I had been hanging out with had been kidnapped, and um, and they were ultimately, after about a year, they were all ultimately found dead in a particularly uh, gruesome way. So um, after that happened, you know, I became super uh, reflective about fate and um, and and sort of why we were in Iraq. I had spent a lot of time there, about about three years, and um, you know, I, the whole war was started on a lie, and there was even now it's not really clear why we're even there. And then I began to think a lot about you know why I was even there, and you know, and and John, and what had happened, and and so this book, which started off as being kind of a book about mercenaries in Iraq, really became in many ways a book about sort of why people were even 
even there. And so I just wanted to read um, a quick passage about, about John and about sort of how crazy it was and kind of how I, I first uh, met him. I mean, there's no fucking way I'm gonna let them cut my head off on the internet, said Josh. He was 23 years old and still looked like a Marine. His dirty blonde hair sheared down to his pink scalp. A tattoo swirled around his left forearm in meticulous cursive, almost like a Hallmark card. It said, the unwanted doing the unforgivable for the ungrateful. We were sitting on the border in the black Chevy Avalanche me and the two mercenaries, blasting the air conditioning, waiting to cross into Iraq. The two of them were telling me about the death pact they had made. As death pacts go, there wasn't much to it. If they were about to be kidnapped, the other merc, whose name was John Cote, was to put a bullet in Josh's head with his Glock, then turn the gun on himself. Sounds reasonable, I told them, and it did. Cote, an ex-army paratrooper, hadn't exactly dropped out of the University of Florida where he'd been an unlikely accounting major. It was more like a well-paid sabbatical. He said he was planning to go back to school in the spring, this time as an exercise physiology major. He was clean cut, well-built, articulate, relentlessly cheerful. You could easily picture him up on a billboard wearing a milk mustache. I'm the kind of kid who has to have fun no matter what I'm doing, he would say. One of the fun things that Cote liked to do was drive around Baghdad, where most Americans tried to, well, tried to melt into the floorboards and blast Led Zeppelin and the notorious B.I.G. through the open window while rocking back and forth in his seat, fingers splayed. Cote was also something of a health nut. On the front seat, he carried canned peaches and assorted nuts along with his locked and loaded AK-47 and a dog-eared copy of the Insider's Encyclopedia on how to build muscle and might. His name was pronounced Cote, and everyone called him that, as in, okay, Cote. His friend Josh Munns was serious business. In 2004, he had fought his way into Fallujah with a Marine sniper platoon. A year later, he found himself installing swimming pools in Redding, California, bored out of his mind. I need something to shock my system to remind myself that I'm still alive, he explained. That was one of the reasons he came back to Iraq. Another was the three-story fixer-upper he had just bought back in Redding with his fiance. Her name was Jackie, just like his mom. Once a month, he took his paycheck, $7,000 in Kuwaiti dinars stuffed into a white envelope to a Kuwait City exchange house, which then transferred the money into his California bank account. It was about 9.30 a.m., early November 2006, and everything shimmered in the heat. The border was a moonscape of rocks and baked earth. The sun washed out by dust and diesel fumes spewing from the semis moving north. We were on our way to Basra, a once peaceful city that now evoked the same dark imagery as the other infamous Iraqi slaughterhouses like Ramadi and the Triangle of Death. None of us wanted to go. The day before, insurgents had taken out three mercs from another company. The U.S. military, with catalog troop fatalities by more than 30 potential causes, didn't count the mercs among the dead. The, account, the attack wasn't on the news. They almost never were, like they never happened. But everyone was talking about it calculating the new odds. I hate that place, one of the mercs kept saying. I hate that fucking place. Our team leader, John Young, was a 44-year-old former carpenter and U.S. Army veteran from Lee Summit, Missouri. He was small and wiry, maybe five foot seven. His shaved head, he shaved his head where he hadn't already gone bald, making it look like his sky blue eyes were sinking back into his head. Young had been in Iraq for nearly two years. One of his proudest possessions was a black flak jacket, frayed at the collar, from where a bullet, a bullet had come out of nowhere one afternoon, slamming him into the steering wheel and nearly ripping through his neck. The company displayed the tattered vest on a card table in the lobby back at headquarters, like a trophy won by the company's softball team. 
Young knew what Young knew he wasn't normal, but he seemed to have come to terms with it. I may be fucked up, but at least I'm talking about it. At least if I'm talking about it, I know I'm fucked up, and that justifies my fucked upness. He told me, smiling. And I'm okay with that today. He couldn't bring himself to leave Iraq. This is me, he would say. This is me. Cote rolled down his window. Hey, Young said. Do you guys know the way? There was a pause as full and pregnant as the Mesopotamian sun. Cote and Josh shot glances at one another. Uh, no, Cote said, his voice rising. Don't you? Young stammered something about Harry's route, something about we'll figure it out and map quest. And I thought you guys knew the way. I wondered if I'd heard that right. Did he say fucking map quest? <laughs> we'll talk about it later, Young said finally, turning to walk away. Josh was fuming. Why the fuck am I riding point? He snapped at Cote. I don't know where we're going. Cote chuckled. Yeah, it's not getting it's not the getting hit part that bothers me, said Josh. It's the getting lost and getting hung from a bridge part that bothers me. The Mercs all had a saying, which I heard in some variation all over Iraq. Come for the money and stay for the life. That was their way of summing up the million different reasons why they were there, why they kept coming back, including the reasons they couldn't articulate and probably wouldn't admit to even if they could. There was the obvious, the camaraderie and the addictive thrill. Iraq as a reality, not as an abstraction. You were part of it, and it was part of history, and soon you were part of history too, even if you were dead. But it went much deeper, and it was mostly personal. Whatever your story was, that's why you were there. It didn't much matter whether your story was true, or whether you told it to anyone but yourself, or whether it changed over time, every day even. I had my own story, of course. We all did, each and every one of us who didn't have to be there, which is to say basically everyone except the military and the poor Iraqis themselves. It's about the stories we tell each other and the stories we tell ourselves to explain our lives and our deaths and everything in between. <laughs>